I am pleased to welcome Eddie O'Para of Map Office to the Walker Cinema. Eddie was born in Britain where he received his bachelor, of, uh, dis, uh, bachelor degree in graphic design from the London College of Printing. A multidisciplinary designer, Eddie's work encompasses a wide range of media and a diverse range of applications. His projects include large-scale electronic motion graphic installations, innovative intranets and software interfaces, print packaging and interior graphics for clients such as Disney Imagineering, Morgan Stanley, Prada, Studio Museum Harlem, the Brooklyn Museum, and the furniture company Vitra. Eddie's has worked for such companies as Art Technology Group, Imaginary Forces, 2x4, and of course his recently formed Map Office. His work has appeared in publications such as Arcus, ID Magazine, Graphis, Surface, and L, among others, and has won numerous awards such as the Art Directors Club Gold Medal, the AIJ 365 Show, and of course ID Magazine Awards. He has taught at the School of Architecture, Columbia University, and is a critic at the Yale University School of Art, where he received his MFA. Please help me welcome Eddie O'Para of Map Office. Hi, Frank. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Andrew, and um, everybody in Minneapolis and Minnesota. Um, well, you know, um, where do I begin? You know, um, this glorious flag that we have here. Um, as you all know, I'm uh, born and, and bred in, uh, in Great Britain, and I'm uh, and a Londoner, but I now live in uh, New York City. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, where I'm from, um, um, how my work has evolved and where we're sort of going from there. Um, I was brought up in, uh, in Wandsworth, London, and I, I, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm not white. <laughs> but I was an English schoolboy and I actually did look like that, but not in the white sense. Um, um, you know, shorts and cap and, and a little bag that I always would lose and my mum would get upset and everything. Um, I, um, I grew up in, uh, in Wandsworth and I went to school in, uh, in Wimbledon, which is well known for its tennis. And uh, I was sort of taught by Jesuit priests, um, which is always a, a, a handful, the, the Jesuit priests that is. And um, I, th but they, they instilled in me uh, an opportunity to think um, not as an individual, but to help um, people as a whole, to understand people in many different ways. And they, they were amazing teachers. And one person that really sort of if, uh, you know, affected me at the time that I was growing up in Britain, and it was a pretty harsh time, was um, um, the Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher. You know, one day um, I go to school and they say, you know, my teacher says, boys, um, we have taken away your milk. You have no milk to drink today. And I was really upset because every kid in Britain had a glass of milk or a bottle of milk at lunchtime for their health. And at this time, she came into power and she took it away from me. And I was really upset. And I was like, what, what am I going to do? You know? So I went home and I talked to my mom. And she said, you know, um, you know I'm sorry about this, but uh, you know, this is what's happening. And they, they called her you know, Maggie Maggie the Milk Snatcher. Maggie Margaret Thatcher the Milk Snatcher. And um, it, it was like really demoralizing to me. And so my mother started talk, talking to me about the Labour Party. And I'm not saying like when I'm six years old that I'm going to join the Labour Party, but it, it made sense in regards to the idea of sharing um, information, sharing what you do as a person, collaborating with people, and not being an individual that is just all out to get money for money's sake. And that's what, the, that's what we were living in in this particular time in, London, in, 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 in Great Britain. We, we were living at a time where money um, was, was, was rife. Um, they wanted to take away the health service, which is still around today and it still works pretty damn well. 
um, you know, take away your education, everything from you. We were pretty well off, but we, you know, my mother believed in this particular system, and so do I. I'm not, I'm not saying this is an advert. <laughs> I'm just saying this is where I come from. And so that sort of idea uh, of, um, of sharing and the idea of collaboration and the idea that you don't really own anything, everybody owns what you do is really important. It's a pertinent part of who I am. And so the idea of, um, um, you know, MAP came about in that particular regard. How, do, how does one understand to, you know, share, to collaborate, to, um, to amalgamate um, a group of people that uh, can work well and develop many different uh, things in many different ways. So um, I'm going to go through the, some of the people at MAP, at the MAP office, actually all the people at MAP office, there are only five of us. <laughs> and um, this is uh, BK, Brankitsa. This is Rayed, or we call him Ray Ray. This is Francis, or Frank. And this is Salvador, Sal. And um, we, we are the MAP office and we believe in the aspect of everybody does everything. You know, you don't, you're not just a book designer, you're not just an engineer, you're not just a writer. We sort of come together as one and we sort of work the system out. We work the particular problems out. And I'm gonna explain what we do over the course of this particular lecture. Um, but right now I'm gonna tell you about where, uh, a little bit of, about where I actually come from, from the point of view of design. So, um, in, I think it was, yes, 1999, I worked for a um, design company um, called Art Technology Group, and that is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's still around, but it doesn't work the same way it used to. Um, right out of school, I, um, I, uh, I joined them and we started building um, amazing different applications like internal apps or social media apps that people use today, similar to like Facebook. And people didn't really understand what I was doing and I was all about the idea of collaboration and um, how to connect people together, how, how you can get more information out of, a, uh, out of groupings, out of a community. And nobody really understood that. And in around about 1999, I started sort of wane. I wanted to go to the big city, New York City. And I had a great opportunity. Uh, a friend of mine, Mikum van Gastel, who was one of the uh, creative directors at uh, Imaginary Forces, called me up at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, one night and said, um, you, would you like to join us? And I was like, sure, but what for? And he said, well, we're doing this project. And uh, I can't really tell you about the, um, you know, the instances about it, but do you know anything about variables? And uh, I, I sort of got on the phone and I said, yes, you know, variables in regards to uh, um, a computer, computer science terminology. And I said, yes, I, I know a lot about variables and I can actually sort of help you in that particular regard. And she says, oh, great, you know, do you want to join Imaginary Forces? And I'm like, I'm not going to LA. She says, oh, don't worry, we're, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, move to New York and we're going to do this project and you can do other projects as well. And I was like, yeah, let me think about it. And over the course of that particular year, I decided to move. And the project that we, we, we built um, was uh, for Morgan Stanley. And if anybody's been to Times Square, it's... Um, it's really not the Morgan Stanley building anymore. It's, um, it was the Lehman Brothers building, and then now it's the Barclays Bank building. So um, not many people know this. So it's the largest screen in the country. It's a block and a half long and um, five to six stories high. And uh, the mission of, of uh, Imaginary Forces was to design and build a very intelligent interactive system, well, actually, a motion graphic interactive system that would work um, to um, brand Morgan Stanley within this part of uh, Times Square, which is not the main part. It's just a little bit up the road, but it's, it's within the zonal area 
where um, New York basically states, if you want to build a new building, you must, you must uh, put up a screen. It, it's, it's by law. It's a law. <laughs> it's quite incredible. You have to put a screen up. And so, um, so that was the mission. And so we developed different pieces that would actually work for this particular screen. Over, over um, uh, well, I think Mekon was working over two years. I was working over a year and a, and a little bit. And um, it was, it, it kind of, you know, grew on us. It's actually still one of my favorite pieces that I've ever done. And what makes it really interesting is that it's not just only motion graphics. It's, it's the whole idea that um, um, we, it had a sense of intelligence. It understood when it, to change itself. It understood um, to push more content to the screen at different particular times. Um, and, and that's the essence of Times Square. It's not just about ads anymore. It's about the in intelligence to um, really um, attract people to the information at large, to share um, uh, content with it. And so this particular scene is actually called X-Ray. And it's, it's basically sharing the content of the building to the people on the street. And that, that's what I, I, I call sort of interesting. Um, OK, the next project, and I'm going to sort of jump over this, is that um, within um, that time frame of Imaginary Forces, that project was only up for two months because of 9-11. It was very unfortunate. And um, um, you know, that, that was a cause to say, OK, I think my, my time is done here. Let me move on. So I moved on to a, uh, a company that's pretty well known um, to 2x4, um, to uh, my professor, Michael Rock. I actually quit my job at Imaginary Forces in the toilet. Um, <laughs> I, I got a call, and I, I had to sit in the, in, the, in the bathrooms and say, OK, yeah, I'll take the job. <laughs> and um, and one of the projects that um, uh, Michael put me on at first was Vitra. And I, I don't think I have anything to show for Vitra uh, today. But um, I also did Prada as well. And it's a great opportunity that one, you know, you're just dropped into this particular realm to do Prada. And, you know, oh my god, you know, that's, that's crazy. And so um, one of my first projects was this project uh, that I'm going to show you. And, um, I was asked, I think it was um, about, I would say, 4 o'clock in the afternoon to design um, a one-way show for Prada, the wallpaper. And I'm like, oh my god, what am I going to do? And, it's, and they said, you must do it by 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. And it's like, oh god, New York City is really a bad place for me. <laughs> and, and so... What I did is I, I, I really thought about typography. I was like, typography is the quickest way to do this. So, you know, just putting type on, the, on this wall for the runway. And um, it was really for the men's, sh men's show for Prada. And, um, and then what I did is I said, screw this. I need to do something a little bit more about me, my identity, who I want to be. And so I said, let me do myself. So I, uh, well, it doesn't really look like me. I think I'm, I'm, well, depending on what part you look at, <laughs> it, it, it sort of, it's, you know, it, it, it sort of depends on what part you. Anyway, so I, I, I developed this piece, and it was actually at Christmas time, and I, it was, I actually had to go on holiday, and um, Michael said, "Okay, what have you got?" So I, I showed what I had, and he's like, "Oh, this is interesting. Can you make this uh, six feet high? You, you, you know, six foot two, my height." And I'm like. Sure, sure. So I printed out this piece that was six foot, six foot high. And said, like, okay, great. And then I just left to go on holiday. I came back, and they did this. <laughs> they took my body, <laughs> and they put it um, in the runway show. Um, they took out particular bits, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know... It was interesting, and it was like it's sort of like this, this, this aspect of I didn't really care what 
he, Michael was going to do to it because I believed in what he was going to do. And it was like the idea, not only you're sharing your content, but knowing that that person's going to take it, even though, you know, even if he's your boss or not your boss, he's going to take it and he's going to do something good with it. I don't care. Whoever takes my stuff is going to generate something out of it. And I'm always intrigued of what the result is going to be. And, you know, <laughs> so I was very, very, very happy about, about that. And so was Muchia Prada. She said that she really loved the modeling and um, she wanted it in the store in New York City. And so um, we started to produce another set of um, pieces for the epicenter. And um, my, I, you know, Michael said the same thing. Um, can you produce different modeling uh, structures for that particular store? And I said, yes. With my help from one of my great friends, Fabian Tejada, we produced pieces like this for the store. And usually what would happen is handbags or watches or shoes would be stuck on there. And we just wanted to make a sort of a world that Michael actually called the Futurama. And um, this is downstairs. If you've ever gone to this store, you've got to go. It's really amazing. And you know the opportunity to do something like that is 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 fantastic. They have this sort of like mirrored um, um, step back of the staircase, and the idea of reflecting off that was really intriguing. And I'll show you another piece that I did as well in this particular store. And actually, this is me um, crouching on the two by four floor whilst my, um, Fabian is actually trying to sculpt me, and then I colored that from from there. So we, these are particular alcoves downstairs in the bottom half of the, uh, of the store. And this is how um, we sort of like generated this whole world of, um, of these models. Um, and it's more like the multiplicity of Eddie has come about and, and created this. And so um, also within the Prada store, um, you have, the, you have uh, Screens ubiquitously placed um, serendipitously around the uh, the store, and um, you have the time frame that you have to produce this is usually about six six weeks to do everything. And this is just downstairs, and there's about 20 to 22 videos that we produced out of this whole piece. You work very fast. <laughs> we work very fast. It was just myself and and Fabian and I think uh, Glenn Cummings and Anisha Stathaliai. Um, one of the things about the pieces that you had just seen um, that's sort of intriguing is that, and you'll see some other video pieces in a, in a second, is that um, the, the work has been utilized in different places. They loved it in the store in New York. They loved it in, in, in Hong Kong. But then I got an email, and this is after I... I uh, spent my time at, uh, at 2x4 from Michael. It's like, check this out. Your stuff is still being used two years after the fact in Taipei. <laughs> and it's OMA AMO um, introducing um, uh, the Taipei Tower. They have a party in the Taipei Tower about this. And I don't know whether it's a Prada party or not. And uh, it's quite interesting how they're using these video pieces that we had created at, in that particular time frame. So I, it's like, again, I don't mind people. I don't care about sharing and utilizing. And it's always amazing what they do with it. It's, it's, so I'm really quite happy about that. This is video from the Prada store itself that we, we created. And do you recall the three screens in that particular bay area? These are the particular. Um, um, videos that we created from that. So it was like a shuffling system. We, 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 we didn't have that much time to produce them. So um, we started to create a sort of jukeboxy system to actually keep changing over the videos from time to time to time. And it was a good um, um, a structure to utilize. And um, throughout the whole store, you have all these different models doing different things. So it's really the extrapolation of, of the, uh, the work that came out of like me modeling myself. And it's now generated like this, so. 
Again, here is another, um, another uh, um, video running in, uh, in the store itself. If I fast forward this, I think I can get a different video here. So we did different models from different angles. You know, they have sort of mannequins sitting on different uh, modeling sets. They have these all pitted around the, uh, the actual store. So it was really an interesting, intriguing project to, to deal with. This is also downstairs in the alcove area. And these are sort of tiny little screens with uh, the sort of model-esque um, um, models walking around um, up and down these particular screens. My last project at, um, at 2x4 um, was quite interesting. Um, Michael received a, um, a call from Remco House stating that the next theme should be a multinational company invading the Prada store. I mean, that's very Rem in you know, a room cool house kind of manner. So Michael explains this to me, and um, he gives me full reign of doing whatever I needed to do. And so I was kind of interested in the idea of uh, the word guilt, actually without a U, to um, you know, guilt something, to um, frame it um, in a particular manner, as it were. And, um, and Michael told me to change it to a U because it, he really wanted it to stand out. No, no New Yorker is going to understand G-I-L-T. And so we did that. And the, the funny thing, this is pretty much where I'm standing. This is the entrance to the, to the store. So let's say you have $5,000 to burn. And you open the door and you see that. <laughs> and it's like, it was just like, wow, these guys have like full reign on, on doing these things. And so the whole idea of this sort of, uh, you know, false multinational company was to create a wallpaper. And this wallpaper is actually also a block long. Um, to create uh, wallpaper that, was a, um, that showed you the brand identity of, of guilt. And, you know, the do's and don'ts of the system. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also, you know, it's quite fun and sort of intriguing to do that because how many people in their, in their lifetime actually see, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> brand structuring? Not many at all. So these are, the, these are the particular items that you can create, that have been created, uh, you know, from this imaginary uh, um, uh, branded. Also, uh, benches that people sit on and um, how modular they are. Also downstairs. So the idea, the mirror actually shows you the word guilt. So when it's printed on the floor, it's actually the other way. It's reversed. So when you're sort of looking up, it, you know, say, oh, I love this bag. And you look around and turn and see guilt. It's like great. Uh, also in, um, in Thai, this is from Anissa. She did this. And sort of like brings me to uh, an identity that, um, uh, that uh, two by four is getting pretty well known for um, that I, I, I designed when, when I was there. And it also sort of embodies what I'm thinking of in regards to um, the flexibility of a brand uh, identity, the idea of it, um, you know, not always changing, but ever growing into something else, or, or uh, the idea that it has different values in, in different manners, uh, de depending on the way you use it. And um, this is all the Brooklyn Museum logos put together as one. <laughs> and uh, this is, you'll never see it like this, which is a really sad, um, you know, situation. But the whole point of this particular mark was to um, reflect what Brooklyn was, or oh, actually is, sorry, um, that it, around it, it's, it's diverse. It is so diverse, you don't know what it is and you don't know what it's going to do next. And inside, it is solid as a rock, like everybody's a Brooklynite. And that's what, it, that's what it means, that's what it does, and you can do anything to it over the course of time. 
So the idea of, you know, of sharing is really out of, out of the picture. The idea of transformation is now coming um, you know, full tilt. Um, and I, th I feel as though this is occurring a lot more within brands now than they, it has been um, um, you know, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years before. And so um, Brooklynites see, the, see this particular identity and they say, wow, uh, that's that's an intriguing uh, concept. Um, they just some of them just like it for its aesthetic structure, which is fine, um, and um, that's all well and true. But I feel as though for me it's a um, a starting point for the tr uh, the idea of getting into a brand and understanding that um, brands can never stay still; that they need to be adjusted over the course of time um, by the community at large. If so, so you are, in a sense, not in control anymore. So these, this is another part, one of the marks. And then these are the, the, uh, the eight that they actually utilize in the museum itself. So that was one of my last pieces. And guilt was actually my last piece um, out, of, um, out of two by four. Um, yes, this gentleman is a wonderful man, as we all know, and um, he's sort of introducing now some of the work that I've done at, at the MAP office. And the MAP office was actually started in 1995 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on a bus going to a friend's wedding. That we were, my friend George Plesco, my best friend George Plesco and I we were a little bit like, not bored, but like pissed off with what we were doing. Um, with a, I was more pissed off in my life than, than his. He had, a, he had a kid and a wife and, and so on and so forth at, at that particular time. And uh, we, we, we started the map office and it was based on um, George's thesis at Yale on mapping. That the whole idea of mapping is that you can map pretty much anything you want and it's all about the interpretation of the user. Uh, and we were like, that's a pretty nice name, map. Um, let's go and check it up on the internet, map.com. No, no effing way that's going to happen. And so we went through a whole structure of trying to define a name, and the map office kind of stuck. But we still use that particular mark that you saw earlier, uh, map, and that's what people call us. But the reason why this gentleman is up here is that um, within like two years of, actually three years of working um, with MAP, we were invited by the Wilsonian Museum in, uh, in Florida to create um, posters um, for their uh, Thoughts of Democracy um, um, theme. And we were like, um, um, democracy, what does democracy mean to us? And, um, and I was really sort of, um, sort of curious because democracy means to me very different. I don't really know, I'm not a citizen of this country, and so I sort of opened it up to the, to the office. And I wanted to see what my, uh, my guys could, could, could achieve. And so we watched and we read a lot of content about democracy. And we came to this particular point of view that we actually don't know what it is, really. It's so many different things. And, um, and we weren't being cynical at, at, at sort of any point in time, but the sort of visual pieces that we came out with were because of this bloke. You know, the idea that um, he has sort of turned my employees into bitter people. And, and the idea that they don't know what democracy really means because he has, he has consumed people in a, in a structure that is not making any sense anymore. And so these are the projects that, um, these are the posters that we came up with. Democracy is the Helvetica of politics. This is from Salvador. And, you know, at first, glance, at first glance when you see it, I mean, if you're a designer, you're just like, you know, um, yeah, all right, oh, well, I know Falvetica. That's that typeface that I've got on my, on my machine, right? 
Oh yeah, I use that all the time. Oh, I, I, I see, yes, it's pretty much standard. It's, it's just a standard of politics. And, um, and then James McKinnon <laughs> developed this. And we, we, you know, we didn't know that, the, you know, we, we were thinking they were going to pick one of them, you know, all that sort of thing. Also, this is another one from James. Kiss the fist of democracy. This is, I, I would say, the, mo the most impressive one uh, of them all, where um, it, the idea of democracy and shoving it down somebody's throat, is it the correct way to explain freedom? You know, um, and what it seems to us as like the right thing to do to others, people are questioning what is democracy? Does it actually work for us? Is it the right way to go? I mean, you cannot stop somebody thinking that or even doing that. You, you can't do it. So, you know, one, one of the things is that we have to understand our particular actions. When we go in somewhere and we start to um, preach the way we are, we don't understand the, the cultures or the, um, the structures of that particular country. We have to be very, very careful. And I think this, this, this poster really, really uh, ex it sort of explains that, I mean, um, from my point of view anyway. Moving on, you know, sort of go through some marks that actually have a lot of meaning of like where we're going um, for the future. And um, I talked earlier about the, uh, the, the uh, whole idea of the flexibility and the transformation of a particular mark, but um, it depends upon the client. You know, we always try and sell this point of view that, you know, your mark can be transformative and, and adjusted and flexible, but not all clients buy that. And at this particular stage, it's, it's always quite, quite hard to get them into that particular flow. So I just wanted to show people some other designs that we've actually sort of created. Um, this is for Sorg Architects in Washington, D.C. And they're, they're well known for building embassies around the, around the world. And one of the great things about Sorg is that their woman uh, is female owned. It's mother and daughter. And they're pretty damn big. And they've really cut themselves a really nice chunk out of, um, out of um, politics, a political building, <laughs> as you could say. But one of the things that they didn't want to be is they didn't want to be female looking at all. And we were like, ooh, this is going to be tough for us. This is going to be very, very difficult. Um, so you want to be masculine looking. And they're like, well, no, we don't. We want to be taken for who we, what we believe in. And that was super key. We believe in construction. We believe in organization or modularity. And that needs to be uh, in effect. And they also believed in the idea of transformation. And so we developed this particular mark. And I, I'm, not, I'm only showing the mark, and we have different sort of structures of how the mark actually works. But it's, it's quite an interesting system where it does look very constructive. Uh, it looks like you can move the, the blocks around. It's very playful. And we sort of enjoy that. And um, we, we always like to have that opportunity to expand upon those types of um, particular projects. Others are not like that. One is the baffler. And um, I, I don't know if anybody knows what the baffler is. It's a literary magazine that died twice. Uh, I died in 1996, came back, and died again in 2004, and came back again this year. And it's a really amazing literary magazine. And one of the things that the, uh, the publisher, Conor O'Neill, wanted from us is to make sure that, of, of course, a, a lot of literary magazines, make sure that the, the writing is, is, um, is, 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 is not crowded by the brand itself. And that was pretty difficult. It's, it's a very sort of left-wing orientated uh, uh, book um, come magazine. And um, we, we tried our best to 
turn it into something which was partly nostalgic, um, but yet um, uh, contemporary as well. And we wanted to make sure that the mark showed that. I mean, this, this typeface was actually designed in 20, um, 2010. So, actually, sorry, 2009, the uh, Latura. And we basically readjusted it to uh, slightly with the B to, to, to reaffirm that. I mean, you know, sometimes I do talk about being contemporary enough, but I also can, you know, we also want to go back and make sure that the client is really happy about the, the ongoing process of, of being nostalgic and contemporary at the same time. We need to create that type of balance in our work. And this is uh, one of the marks. Um, the actual book is actually in the bookstore um, um, uh, outside, and you can also buy these online at uh, thebaffler.com. Another mark here is North 8. So I'm going to sort of switch back and forth. I, I like to do that um, <laughs> a lot in regards to what I'm looking at. And um, North 8 was actually a, a, um, a luxury condominium <laughs> in, in New York City. I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I, 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 I am. Um, part and parcel of some of the work that we do is, uh, uh, is luxury condominiums. And uh, I don't like to show too much of that. But this was an interesting one. This, if, does anybody know what the Toll Brothers is, are? The largest developer in the country and towards actually the world. And this is one of their pieces. And we were really shit scared in regards to building for them. We had seen their Mac Mansion types of things. And we were like, what are they going to build in New York City? This is going to be interesting. And so um, they just left us to do what we needed to do to sell this particular piece. This is a, a building in Williamsburg uh, in Brooklyn. And we needed to sell it to a very young crowd um, of, 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 of buyer. And one of the things that I wanted to do is not only des design this particular mark like this, but also educate the client about the mark. So I don't know if anybody knows what I'm using here, but it's News Johnston um, from the uh, London Underground. And um, I don't think I'm supposed, I can't use this in Britain, I'd get arrested. But so I used it in America. <laughs> I was like, this is a beautiful typeface, I'm gonna use it, I don't care. And they really liked it because it's really bold, very, you know, very pronounced. And um, one of the things is, uh, I, you know, at meetings, I would actually educate them about typefaces. And they, were, they would always be like, oh, oh he's going to do his quiz. Let's get ready. <laughs> you know? So I started doing quizzes for, for the client because they are not introduced to things that I know. And that's an important factor. If, if we can all actually, you know, do a pop quiz for a client, um, you know, I think things will go a lot smoother in regards to developing for, 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 um, for them. Again, this is a, 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 another mark that we developed for Delavelle and Bernheimer. It's a very long-winded um, um, name of a company, LLC, sorry. Just had to add that to the end. And um, they are a uh, wonderful group of architects that we, uh, that we work for. And, um, one of the things that we wanted to develop here was something so simple, but yet it wasn't solidified. It was never, um, you know, you're always reading the outline. You're not reading into it. And um, this, is, this is one of the marks that, uh, that we, we generated for them. Actually, this is the final mark that we, we, we built for them. Here's another one for JET. This is for Jury Ethics and Trust. This is for UCLA's Rumble. And we're sort of getting back to our sort of um, comical use here. And this is a mark that also changes its it adjusts over the course of time slightly, but, sh uh, but surely. And talking about UCLA, um, this is a mark that we, we really, really loved. Um, and I say loved because they, don't, they can't use this 
um, anymore. This is for the architecture school. This is what I'm talking about, the, the uh, architecture and urban design school. We developed this because um, I was uh, asked to redesign pretty much all their collateral uh, for them. Um, they wanted to become one of the top, um, the top architecture school in the country. They wanted to beat out Harvard. They wanted to beat out Yale and Princeton. They, um, they have an amazing faculty for a public school. And they have an amazing director in Hitoshi Eba who wanted to pronounce them as the best. So they have Thom Main, Greg Lynn, Neil Denari, some of the really top names. And one of the things that they didn't ask me for was an identity. And I was like, this, this can't happen. I mean, what, what are you using now? And they were like, well, you know, we use this, and then we use this, and then we use this, and we can use this sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, what about that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so it was like, no, you know, to solidify this structure, um, this message, you need something that's going to work throughout. It's going to resonate. And with Neil Denari's uh, help, we actually developed this particular mark. Um, it was used for about a year, and we looked at the ana we looked at analytics um, from the s of website, from from different um, brochures, from um, from from students and, fa and, and other faculty from different uh, schools, from parents, and their, their intake, the amount of, of students they wanted, um, they had to increase, I think by, I don't know, 60%. I mean, it was like in enormous amounts of people wanted to, to go to this particular school. And I'm, I'm not saying it's only because of this mark, because of the message that was occurring. Now, the university, came in, they stepped in, and they spent, I think, hundreds of thousands of dollars developing what they have now. And um, um, it's, it's a bit unfair to say that it's, you know, you could have done it in f about 50 minutes, but somebody really got paid on that job. I mean, holy crap, it's Optima slanted. And the whole university uses it. And I, you know, I looked at it and I was like, that's Optima. And then, oh, that's Optima. OK, right. Uh, and uh, the university came in and said, you cannot use this mark. You must use this instead. And um, the, the school um, fought very hard for us, tooth and nail, and unfortunately lost. And so we were a little mortified. And so were they, a lot more mortified than we were. And so what we did is we created a different mark for them, um, one that transforms each and every time. So we, we took the, the mark that they have now, and we started to create different configurations out of it. So the, the university couldn't really say what it was. It doesn't say UCLA, does it? Hey, hey. it, it, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> And this is actually one of them. And so if you go to the website, you'll actually see it like transform itself. And we've also used this in different places. But we also now actually have just normal type, typography that they use now, um, now and again. And so we were really intrigued by this. We were really intrigued that the whole idea of, of creating a transformative um, of a mark. And I, I think if we, if we get any chance, we're going to try to do this again and again and again. It's very important to us. Um, I'm just going to show you an animation of the previous mark that we used to have. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay, mum. Okay. <laughs> this is my mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> and that's my, one of my aunts. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Nigerian. Um, and my, when I was a kid, my mother always said to me, you know, Eddie, you've got to, you've got to finish what any, you know, you've got to finish the things that you start, you know, like clean your room, you start cleaning your room, and you're like, hmm, maybe that, that, that table needs to go there. You know, as a designer, you're just like, yeah. and you're like, you know, little eight-year-old, like, I think I should go there. Oh, you know, this is not going to work. I need to go out and play. <laughs> and I'd never finish anything I'd do. 
And my mother said, you've got to finish things that you start. And so I'm actually, you know, I've tried very hard to do that. And I came to this decision that it doesn't work. You should never finish what you start, especially in this century. It's not about that. You never will. Sorry, mum, but you were wrong. <laughs> and I'm going to show you some pieces that, you know, we started, but I don't know if we're ever going to finish them. And one of them is a, uh, a wall piece. Um, and um, we, we kind of call nickname Stealth. It doesn't really have a name, but we call it Stealth. And uh, it kind of came out of this um, proje these projects that we were doing for Studio Museum in Harlem, where there's one of our, our clients. And um, I, I love this. It's a, it's, a, it's a small, if you ever get the chance to go to New York, go to that museum. It's not really a museum, it's like a gallery. And it's really beautifully done. And um, we had the opportunity to do all their literature for them. And I also worked when I was at uh, 2x4 on their particular logo mark, their identity. And one of the things that they had that, um, at Studio Museum, they had these rockin' parties. They still do every summer. So in the summer, go to New York City and go to the Studio Museum um, in Harlem and go to one of those great parties they have in the back. And I wanted to celebrate this, 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 this um, one of the parties in the summer with a piece for them. And I, I remember reading Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, uh, you know, when I was younger, and the aspects of identity, and especially being, um, being black, and also, you know, the idea of being African-American in, in America. And the majority, you know, majority of the actual piece, uh, the book, is, is set in Harlem. Ralph Ellison is actually writing. And what I wanted to do was, you know, one of the sections affected me a lot. And, and what I wanted to do was create, recreate that in a, in a printed piece. Yeah. And can everybody read this? This is, I am invisible, understand simply because people refuse to see me. If you go up to it, you cannot see it. And it's, and it's just an optical, you know, play. Um, and um, it's very intriguing. And this is part uh, of the text from Ralph Ellison. And it, it really resonated to us. But it's not going to work as it is just flat. I mean, it can work as flat. But as I said, we've got to keep moving. You know, we've got to transformative. Let's change it into something else. And so we started to fold it. Fold it even more. And it came out like this. And it's like, <laughs> it looks like a stealth bomber, doesn't it? And actually, that was one of our reasons, that we wanted it to look something like a stealth bomber. The uh, whole idea of the stealth is that it's not really invisible, is it? <laughs> Visually, it's not invisible. I mean, everybody knows what a stealth bomber looks like. <laughs> but yet, it's supposed to be invisible. And it's the same sort of thing that Ralph Ellison was right, trying to portray. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm a black man, a very visible person, but in this society, I am seen as in invisible. And so we were like, OK, we've gone this far. So what are we going to do with it? So we gave them to Studio Museum. And we did something. We started to put them up on the wall in the studio. It's Salvador and it's James. And this, this wall is 13 feet high. And I can't, it's really long, actually. This is just part of the wall. And we started to create this sort of message, or wallpaper. Oops a wallpaper of the particular piece. And you know, when people came in to, to, the, to the studio, they would see this, this enormous, gigantic piece. And they were like, how the hell did you do that? And what the hell is it? And we're like, well, it's like a wallpaper now to us, or a wall sculptor. I said, can I have one? And they said, yeah, sure. And so we fold them, put them in a plastic bag, and we, we have thousands of them. Put them in a plastic bag, and they ha come with little pins and instructions to pin them to your wall. And so that's, that's just like, 
it, 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 it sort of moved, it sort of graduated from this flat piece to a folded piece to a large wallpaper piece. And we don't know what it will do next. Maybe it will create a, a room out of it. So it's always changing, it's ever adjusting itself. And we really love that whole appeal. So I'm going to go into identity a little bit more and sort of like settle down with the idea of trans, you know, transformation. And this, is, this is a book called Figure, a Glenn Ligon, we, we designed uh, a year ago. And Glenn came into, the, he's an artist, um, African-American um, gay artist. He came into our um, offices and he said, I've had these uh, sort of Warholian prints that I, I created years ago sitting around and they're going to do a show in Paris for me. Can you produce it? And we were like, yeah, we can produce this book for you. And the great thing about it was that it was all about identity. And we, we really, at the time, we had just done stealth. We were really into this um, aspect. And we designed this very simple piece Of, um, of his work, and this is Glenn, and each, each print, like very Warholian, is very different from the next. And we rarely get the chance to just take something and make, and, and make it um, um, as interesting and inspirational as possible. I mean, it's a really inspiration to see these pieces and very calming to, to me to look at, at, uh, at this type of work. And it's just about him. Every piece is just about him. And they're very, very tiny, you know, nine, nine by six inches each piece. It's a very delicate sort of type of book. So go back to the stealth, and this is another marker of what the stealth is. OK. Transformative, transformative, transformative. It's an interesting word to use. This is TikTok. <laughs> and um, this is really uh, very interesting. Um, we were asked by J. Walter Thompson, JWT, the New York office, to um, create a book for them, an annual book that showcased their work over, over that year. And they were going to take the book and not sell it, but give them out for free. I mean, like advertising agencies, wow. Give them out for free. It's like a 300 paid book um, <laughs> um, for free at the Cannes, at the Cannes um, Advertising um, Festival. And we were like, yes, nice one. Yes, let's do this. And the creative director, there, Graham Wood, who, who used to be at Tomato, one of the partners at Tomato, uh, had this idea about visualization of what JWT is globally. And that sort of interested me um, and what we could do with that within the matter of time of five weeks. Um, and so we developed TikTok. And it's really about what I just said. It sort of visualizes the, um, the company over uh, globally over the course of that particular year and what their interests are, what, what they dealt with in, in those particular campaigns. And so this is the, um, um, this is the uh, design. Actually, this is printed in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. I can't, I can't remember the, the printer there. Um, and, um, and it, we really, truly, really love it. This exposed spine. And this is part of the interior. We sort of um, created these interiors where we're, we're sort of creating these sort of pie charts that sort of explode out and, and actually explain um, what campaigns are where, uh, the introduction, all that kind of stuff. And we're sort of calculating information. And over on the... Uh, over there, we have things like dominant colors that are used in the campaign for crafts, whether it's on TV, 
or internet. It was l well loved by people on the radio in the location of like Asia. It's in English. The typography is sans serif, and the client is craft. You know those types of things. Pulling out um, and identifying what is going on. So that was just a, a little indicator. But then we also, within the transitional pages, created um, systems for. Um, JWT, where we looked at their global score, and they have this system where um, they mark each campaign out of 10. And as you can see, uh, Africa is non existent. They don't care. Well, it's not that they don't care about Africa, it's that they don't really sell there at all. Um, and more importantly, as you can see, Asia is blowing up real big. And so we, st we, we started to measure things, you know. Uh, you know uh, Edward Tufty would I have my head for this type of thing, but you know, um, <laughs> um, you know, the idea that uh, um, it sort of indicates what's going on within the world at, uh, uh, at the particular quarters of 2000, I think, eight to 2009. <clears throat> Again, here we're looking at the full spectrum, and the full spectrum is looking at the visual aggregate of uh, the principal colors that are used in, in advertising through the different regions. Uh, and we, you know, you can just say, you know, JWT, use a little bit more green, please. <laughs> so it's really like the analysis of, of them. Um, and they, they really liked it. It was a very sort of truthful sort of aspect of, of things. They use a lot of black and white. Oh, my God. <laughs> Again, here we have this uh, in a tr transitional page called Fruits of Labor. And these are all the, the, uh, the campaigns that we showed. This is a test one because I've got Nestle twice here. But like, um, this is actually in the book as well. But the, the, the inf interesting thing about the book and how, how the book is inviting to people is, is not just through the, the um, uh, the words inside, but it's actually the cover. The cover's lenticular. And so it's, it, it, it's changing every, it's, it's transforming. So it's looking at the dominant colors and it's tick tock, tick tock. So this is Frank holding the book and it's about this big and it's about this thick. So thank you, Frank. And we'll go back to some JWT work uh, later on. <clears throat> um, yes, we didn't design this. This is courtesy of St. Regis Hotel. This is actually one of our first projects that we did with a company called Potion, Potion Design. We share a studio space with Potion Design. And they're, they're my friends, Philip and Jared, um, Philip Chionkson, Jared Schiffman. They're both uh, MIT Media Lab um, um, grads and they are geniuses just to let them know they are absolutely amazing they were nominated uh, for a national design award last year and uh, they, they create um, touch tables I mean we have one here at the Walker but these guys I think at the War Museum in Kansas this thing is like 30 feet long and it's interactive it's multi-touch and <laughs> And I remember, you know, we used to have an entirely, really tiny space that we used to work in. I, mean, I used to be here, and I think Salvador's behind me, and then Philip's over there, and Jared's there. How the hell did they build a 30 foot? Oh, yeah, it just amazes me what they're doing. And so this is the St. Regis Hotel in, in New York City. And one of the pieces that we developed was this particular, yes, we didn't design the table. Rockwell uh, designed this um, insane um, gold table. But um, it's a, uh, a multi-touch um, table uh, for sommeliers. Um, well, really not for sommeliers, for people to learn more about wine. And the sommelier is really the instructor. And um, one of the great things about this particular system is that, um, you know, um, we, we developed the user interface, but the great thing is that you can share information from one user to the next. 
Um, and I'm going to show you some video over the course of time. So this is the, um, you know, you select from the menu, what, what, would you, what would you like, whether it's red wine, white wine, you know, champagne, sparkling, all that kind of stuff. And then it sort of tells you about the wine that you're, you're tasting through these little, like, um, pa um, uh, petals that you basically touch, whether it's the varietal, the tasting, the origins, the region that it's in, you know, it's, it's very sort of important. And this, this again is another area. And we've, we, we've gone into this, um, um, this, this restaurant, it's called Odeur in the St. Regis. And the thing is, if you ever want to go in and you want to sit down, the, the wine starts at, well, actually glass starts at 15 bucks, which is not so bad, and that's, but that's the only one you can get. Everything else is like 50 to 80 to 100 to 1,000. And so you have to just ask for a particular Prosecco for 15 bucks and you can sit down. So just to let you know, but it's a really great experience. And so um, this is the, the piece that I wanted to show you. This is actually it working. This is Jared's fingers. <clears throat> and so we sort of meddle with different user interfaces. We have to understand what um, the engineer wants us to do, such as Jared in this particular case. And it's all projected. Uh, down, and it's quite quite interesting. So it revolves out. And start touching it, and and that there is a, a larger dining table that does exactly the same thing in the particular course. The idea of scrolling is there, and so I, I wanted to show this because I wanted to show you. You know, this is our introduction into um, our sort of interactive software area. And in this particular case, we developed the UI, but we also are developers ourselves, and I'm going to show you a couple of pieces that we've, we've built. Okay. Thank you, Jared. One of the pieces is um, this piece for um, the Orchestra of St. Luke's um, in New York City. In the Orchestra of St. Luke's, every Christmas, um, has a wonderful educational um, program. And they bring together a lot of the public schools in New York City at a, the Apollo Theater in Harlem to learn about music. And we thought that this is a great piece. It's like a pro bono piece that we would do something. But yet again, it's always like, oh, we've got like three weeks. Can you build some interactive piece that we can utilize? It's like, oh my God, you know, you don't understand. <laughs> this takes time. Why can't you come to us earlier? And so it's always this sort of like, you know, um, smash something together and make sure and pray to God it's going to work, you know. And so this is our first time. We've only really done it twice because the program director actually left after a while. And so um, this, this is, this is uh, pretty a lot of public school um, audience. And they have, they have four of these a day. And the, the, the place is packed full of kids and their, their, their teachers to teach them about Beethoven and Mozart and Offenbach. And it was a great opportunity. And we were like, how are we going to teach these kids about rhythm? And it's all about rhythm, the idea of building rhythm and understanding to keep it and maintaining it. Um, and we developed this little thing. <laughs> it's a drum um, with a USB hookup in it with a bunch of um, phone call. That's right. And uh, it's a drum hooked up to a computer. And that's one of the best ways to learn for a child is they start tapping. And it's like, da 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 And so we did all these tests, and we found out that that was the optimal way to actually allow these kids to know um, what to do. And as you can see, this is the prototype. And then this is the final piece. Ta-da! So you know, um, we went out to like, Toys R Us and actually got a drum, stuffed it in, hooked it up, and made it work. I was going to say we designed this, modeled it. It looks like, you know. <laughs> and what happened, well, this is a really weird thing. What happened was we didn't know the setup of the orchestra at the time. And so we thought that the kid was going to be at the front. But they were at the back. And we were like, what the hell are 
at the back, and they should be with the conductor. It's all about the kids. So the kids had to go up the up the side of the of the uh, of the the stage, sit at the back, and wait for their turn. And we had this little laptop. And, and, the, and the drum, and they were tapping on the drum, da, 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 and somebody would be like, shut up, shut up. And what would happen is that it would project these types of designs, abstract designs for, the, for you. Every time you, you, you tried to tap on it, it would create these great graphics. And these are the projections that they created. And all about rhythm, and they would be moving at the same time. Problem with the, the uh, um, uh, the Apollo is that it's really hard to film in, and so all our video is black. <laughs> but these are, these are uh, screens that we, we, we captured with. And the kids were having so much fun. They thought it was a game. And, um, you know, it's totally transformative. Every kid had a, it was an entirely different sort of construct. Every kid that came up was quite beautiful. This is Mozart. The second year, we were like, you know, we're going to do a better one, damn it, you know? And it's like, oh, you've got two weeks. Oh, crap. So we, we, uh, we thought about it, you know, thought about introducing the drum again, advancing upon it. You know, what are we going to do? So we decided on creating something with the we. And uh, we wanted the kid to be at the front with the conductor it's the best way you know to be conducting at the same time that conductor's doing it and we thought the we is the perfect uh, device to do that type of thing and i have again um the the video that i have is very very um dark and we were doing tests in the studio at the time so when I show this, show you this, this is, I think, Salvador, yes. And so he actually has the Wii in his hand. And so what's happening in this particular time, it's all about jazz music. He's, the kid is actually building these uh, collages at the same time, waving the hand and then clicking on the Wii at this particular time. So it's a little bit chaotic, and you can only see little parts of it. But, you know, it sort of did the job. We were like, wow, totally astounded. And we had different sort of theme, thematic structures. So this is Salvador again in the studio, just trying to work his interesting magic. No kid is actually going to do that, Salvador. You know. <laughs> but uh, that being the case, I'll shut it off there. OK. So it brings me to um, another area that we are trying to develop in. Knowing that we create UIs and we started to slowly program particular things and you know we and making our own little devices, we wanted to do something for more other people. We wanted to develop a piece of, piece of software that anybody could utilize. And uh, we were sort of you know, scratching our head. I was scratching my head. It's like, what's that? What could that be? With only five of us. Well, at the time we used to be eight. Now we're five. And um, I was like, mm, interesting. Let me think about that. Let me go back in time. And you know, what we used to develop at our technology group was content management systems. You know, uh, for these social networks. And you really, it's one of the underlying like hidden systems that people don't know what they look like, don't give a crap what they, that they do or look like. And we, we said to ourselves, we can be able to build one of these. It would actually um, you know, take our clients off our backs. Like, how do I do this? And how do I do that? And I don't understand XML. And I don't, you know, and it's just like, oh my god. You know, we need to build a piece of software that will allow us to avoid the client, <laughs> and it doesn't—it it doesn't exist. But any, in any way, um, so we 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 started building something called the MIG, and um, um, this is this is pretty much it. It is a, a RIA, rich internet um, application. It's built in Flex. This is the interface. 
and it's very, very fast. It's working on the browser. One of the things is that you can sort the containers and containers hold all your information. So it's pretty much like your desktop. And um, the music, by the way, is actually created by Salvador Arara at the, um, at the studio, um, sort of his own original music. So this is the idea of publishing containers. So if you've ever used Drupal before, you, you always have one screen, one screen, one screen, one screen, one screen, one, and you know, all these systems are always one screen. We wanted it to be a little bit more like using a desktop app. So the idea here is that I publish these, but I, uh, and now I've published them, I've grabbed them, and now I've actually published it, I've taken it out. And it's, it's, it, this is how it works. Here's a pending container. And containers, uh, let me extrapolate a little bit, they hold media, text, they, they hold uh, tags and categories, um, they can be searched in, they can be filtered, um, you name it, they can, they, can, they can basically do it. So here is um, you know, a very simple manner of like unpublishing information and then publishing again. Here is adding inf images. One of the things about uh, the web is like, how do I add images to my website? And why is it so laborious? Why is it so slow and so laborious? Can I speed it up? So we made a system where you can upload multiple files from your desktop or from your server. Pull that over a little bit. Here we go. And you know, I'm gonna go and find some of my images. Drag the whole photo. Boom. I'm in. Now I need to publish these. Can I publish them? Sure. Boom, 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 boom. Totally published, done. You know, those types of elements, oh, these are tags. So should I tag these? Yeah, they're all tags and there you go. So they're totally searchable now online instantaneously. Now I've uploaded them using an XMP system. I don't want to go too technical, but that's what Adobe uses in Bridge and Extensus and Lightroom and you can hook it up with the metadata. I can take three images if I needed to and publish those and add the tags into those if I needed to or not. So these, um, every site that we build since I think a year and a half or two years, yeah, has this on the back end. And it's now, um, um, you could say, agnostic. It doesn't have to be a flex flash um, front end, it can be a HTML front end, and it could be a C++ front end. It doesn't really care what it, it, the front end is. It, 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 that, that's the whole point. I mean, that's one of the major problems of the internet. I mean, we care too much about the front ends and all that kind of stuff. And here's the sorting structure. So, you know, there we go. So uh, clients like Aero, uh, JWT uses this. They don't actually don't know they, they have this one on the back end of one of their sites. Um, it's a site that we just generated called um, shopbyfans.com, and I'll show you what that is in a, in a moment. That's just deleting it. You know, so it's like dragging to trash, right? Um, and selecting, dragging to trash. updated, finished. You know, one of the things that we want to do with the system is, you know, when people see it, they're like, holy crap, this is really cool, this is great. Oh, this is one of my favorite pieces, actually. The idea of how, to, how the hell do you link information? You know, um, can I link something? Can I find it? Yeah, sure, I can find it. But again, can I link that information to, uh, to another container? Oh yeah, sure. Let me go open whatever I want and then link it. So on the front end, it links to another part of the site that instead of typing it in, you know, you don't need that. So one of the things that we want to generate, and I'll show, I, I might show you the, the MIG running live in, in a minute on one of our sites, is that we want it to be open standard. We can't say open source because Adobe is not open source open standard. We want developers, developers, developers to come on board, build any type of module they want and hook it up to the MIG. You know, make any kind of um, manager they, they feel like. We have tag managers, 
time managers, media managers, user managers. And if you can think of anything else, or you have friends that want to get into this, we want to make this open so that other people can use it. The whole com design community can have it, use it any which way they want, but it, the interface, the visual interface structure stays the same. The, the, the functionality stays the same. It feels like the desktop. It's easier to use. I mean, this is what we call next generation, and we are really serious about it. If we can be a little bit more like Drupal, I mean, Drupal is going like sky high with all the things they're doing, but have you ever seen Drupal? Have you ever looked at it? Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. they have books on Drupal, on how to use it. And it's too complicated. It's, it's, you know, engineers know how to use it, but designers and clients, it's really, really difficult. And so we, you know, we believe that a, a whole bunch of other designers um, believe it. There's a couple of guys that, um, that actually are Yale grads as well that have their own CMSs, they, um, Dan Michelson, is one, and uh, David Ryan, um, Reinford is another, and they have their own. And they, they started developing because they were sick and tired of using the same standard stuff. Um, and we are sick and, we were sick and tired of it. And we want this system to grow and, um, and be helpful to uh, the community at large. It's not a MIG. These are the sites that it's uh, built so far. Well, some of them, actually. This is the kitchen. This is the second version of the kitchen. The first one was Flash. This one's HTML, because they were like, we're sick and tired of Flash. We're sick and tired of Flash. You know, so, so, so we were like, OK, OK, we'll build HTML for you. And it's, it's actually better. <laughs> but it uses the MIG on the back end. The Baffler. It's a, it's a blog, actually. It's more of a blog system. Um, and it's utilized on, uh, the MIG is utilized on the back end. Uh, UCLA is Flex. This is actually, this is one of my favorite sites actually. It has multiple windows that are translucent. You can actually change the backgrounds. You can turn, can turn a lot of things off. It's, it's very interesting. It works similar to like a, a Windows interface. Uh, this is Flex, but it has the MIG on the background uh, in, in the, um, uh, as a CMS. This is the latest piece that we did for JWT um, called Shop by Fans. They came to us and they said, it's always the five week thing. What is, what's up with that? And they said, can you make, and this is in London, this is JWT in London, so I'm gonna just be a Londoner for a second. Can you make us a, a system that edits video in five weeks? <laughs> and we were like, uh, 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 we'll do a test in two weeks. How about that? Yeah, sure, no problem. So we did a test and we are like, and the test, didn't really work that well. And then they saw it, it's like, oh, this is, this is smashing. And like, it doesn't really work that well, you know, what, what are we gonna do? And so um, they said, well, we'll give you like the five weeks to actually you know, sort that out. <laughs> and so we did. We created a video, a video editing system using the MIG platform, the uh, underlying infrastructure that Ryed Atui had uh, at Map Office had, had built out with also Ryan Lau, Salvador Rara, and, 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 uh, and, and Frank LaRocca helped to build out this system. And it's, it's quite interesting. It has 165 um, configurations of the same video. And does anybody know what the noise, who the noisettes are? Yeah, hands up. Yeah, there's a couple of hands. They're, they're a British band they're getting really big, and they had this song called Saturday Night. And, you know, um, the client didn't have enough, the budget didn't, couldn't give us a media server. So we had to use a, a, a little bit more of an expanded server structure. The media servers cost a little bit more money, but th this system works quite well. And so what happens is the 165 um, f uh, videos are stored on the MIG, and you can select them uh, anytime. And what you do is a standard sort of drag and drop. So you can create your own video version. You can drag and drop your, your videos into the particular area. And then you can take the in and outs. And I'll use this little button here because I'm use this right now. You can take this little in, uh, this little out, sorry, and this, this out in, 
and you can you can you can basically cut slice the video to precisely what you want. Once you've had that, you can actually run a preview. It will load up. You, you used to have on-the-fly video uh, previewing, and then there was it started corrupting a lot it, when more people started using it. So we had to actually create a loader. Once once the uh, um, the, the internet is free of loaders. Oh my God, it's going to be so good. Um, <laughs> so um, you can basically preview what you've created. You only have three minutes and 18 seconds of video to produce. Once you've produced that, you can submit it. It generates the video, sends you an email, all your friends to check out the video that you've created. And it's fun. There's some crazy, crazy videos that you can actually create. So these are just other screens that uh, talk about the video. So here's uh, another, another slide about that editing and submitting of that information. And all uh, the great, uh, another thing is once, it's, once you've created the video, it's stored on the MIG. And then they can go back, find out who's used it and what the video is. So it stores it and runs the videos for you. It's not just for sites. The MIG is not just for sites. Um, as I was saying, <clears throat> it is, you know, it's agnostic. It doesn't care. Uh, you know, it's not evil. It just doesn't really need to care. Um, this, is a, this is a mark that we, we made for a, a, um, a project, another five-week project, and I'm not kidding you, it's five weeks, called The View, JWT View. I mean, they seem to like us, or they liked us uh, last year. Um, it got another call from London early on in the summer asking us to develop a visualization engine after TikTok that visualized anything, uh, any content that they put into it. And we're like, oh my God. How are we going to do that? <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought it was going to be just a conceptual piece, you know. And we built it out. We used uh, Adobe Air to do it. We used the um, MIG platform to run it. And uh, I, I will be actually running this particular program live for you, hopefully, in a couple of minutes. But one of the things that we had to figure out was, well, what, did the inf what does the information look like? So I started to figure out what kinds of, of objects um, could be displayed on the screen and in what types of of ways, and again, here is, is this is not a very Tufty esque sort of diagram, but it, it, it's showing you from unit objects to relationships to mean average target structures what kinds of systems we could actually generate on this particular platform. And uh, this is another interface Frank Morocco uh, was um, creating in regards to showing the. Uh, the, um, the hierarchical structure of, uh, of information. Oh. <clears throat> Again, here is more of a brand-orientated thing because they're, they're an advertising agency. They, they need to know where the brands are, where they exist. Is that possible? I mean, we were looking for all possibilities, but we only had five weeks, so we had to cut it all the way down. These are some other sketches. Targeting structure. Information. Oh, so I'm going to cut that out and I'm going to go to the. Oh, here we go. Hello. View. I've been waiting. So this is the view and it's a, it's a desktop application, um, Air App. And so if I type in Blair or something, it's going to ask me, I'm sorry, that client is not in the database. Redo the search. So I'm going to redo the search. And I'm going to, uh, you know, um, type in JWT. And the reason why I'm going to type in JWT is we, we left this for them to use for like, six months. And they started putting content in. We didn't. We weren't allowed. And one day, Riad checks the system. We haven't checked it for a long time. And we saw this, this one called JWT. And we were like, what the hell is this? Hopefully, it will load. Doesn't look like it's going to load, is it? Oh, dear. That's a bloody pity. 
You know what? That's a really annoying thing. Hold on one second. This always happens, doesn't it? Okay, I'm going to quit that and I'm going to run it again. Do, do, do. Come on, mate. Do it, Freddy. Actually, it doesn't look like it's going to come up. This is un very unfortunate. Oh, dear. Not going to work. Oh, dear. Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. But it was going to work before. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to slowly explain it on the, last, um, on the last slide, is that what it does, and you can go to our site, and I think we have a video of it. What it, what it does is that you can put your information in similar to an Excel sheet, and you can also do it over the course of time. And so let's say from like 1972 to 2005, what it will do uh, is change the information right in front of you. It will actually um, readjust what's going on visually. It's very hard to determine because I, I was going to show you live and I don't have any of the slides to show you what it actually looks like, which is very, very unfortunate. Shall I try it again? Yeah? All right. Sorry about this. I really don't know. I don't think, I, I don't think it's coming up because it would tell, tell me that it's... Uh... Let me shut down the internet and then turn it on again. Is that okay? Or maybe like Ryad said, he's probably finished and he'll just shut it down or something. <laughs> oh, that's why. I think your internet's down. Oh no, looks like it's coming up. No, doesn't look like it's coming up at all. Oh yeah, it does, but it's not, it's not running. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I will show, I'll try and show you the MIG in a second. Um, but I'm going to show you my last slide. And um, <laughs> this is a funny one. My first employee was Salvador Rara. And um, I used to work from home. And one day, he was wearing this t-shirt. And I didn't know who Francesco Rinaldi is. You know? like he, it's some, some tomato sauce thing, right? Some spaghetti thing. <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, is that like a philosopher? Interesting. You know, because I was always sort of like, as I get older, I get better. You know, I got better. And so I changed it to like, as we get older, we get better. And I think it's like a motto for the map office that, you know, we started four and uh, four and a half years ago. And we've, we've come this far with a very small crew of people. And we do a variety of different types of designs. And I think this is not just for us, but everybody else. It's like, as a designer, I think we should believe in ourselves that as we get older, we get better with our designs. It's not that the young guys are going to come in and take over. It's like, you know, it's like a great wine, you know? It, it gets better over the course of time. And I know that, you know, I may have done some flashy things at 2x4 and the imaginary forces, but the, the, the worth of the work that we're doing right now is way more important for the future. That you're always changing, you're never staying the same, you're always getting better. Um, as a consolation, I'm going to try and run the MIG for you online. Uh, as of the view, I was really sort of disappointed with that. Sorry about that. But um, let me just quit out of my keynote and run one of the MIGs. So this is the baffler. Let's see if it runs. Yeah, there is something wrong with the internet. Hold on. Or maybe our, uh, maybe, the, one second, let me just. 
I don't know. Yep, there is something wrong with the internet. Accept it. Oh, pornography. All right, I'm sorry. Saw that. Very quick-witted. Sorry about that. Maybe that was what the problem was. Ah! <laughs> All right, here we go. Come on, mate. Do daddy. Do daddy special. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go, lad. Yay! All right. All right, thanks, view. Thank you. So here we have it. These, these are only three um, um, sort of visual features that we could actually provide at the time that they asked us. You know, they were like, can you do 20? I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, you can't even do one. So clusters is the most important system. And this is JWT. And we're like, what the hell is this? Somebody's inputted all this content. And we're like, holy crap. That's enormous amounts of content. And we're like, what is W... All right, if anybody is on the, on the video cast, uh, JWT, can you tell me what WCC percentage five plus all time by regions is? I'm not joking. It's like, it sounds really in impressive. And I just want to know what it is. It's a great thing about it. What one should be building now is our shells, our vessels that clients can put anything into and readjust to transform what is going on, that you are not in control as a designer anymore. You should lose control. And that is uh, the purpose here. So I'm like, oh, what the hell is this? I'm like, I was like, whoa, what's going on? You know? And so this is one of the things that you can do with the MIG. It actually um, changes uh, right um, mid-flow of there. I'm like, I don't know what United States is at eight and, and Great Britain is at two and stuff like that. But I can run it by perception okay boom that's interesting you can also like find out more information no data on that one um, no data on that one either so they haven't put any data in volume group I really don't know what volume group is boom and then you can also go back and, and run it by re you know oh what's this one WD category very, very interested. Improve star review. They're probably going to fire my ass for showing this stuff. Uh, <laughs> somebody's taking like notes. And um, can 2008 points. So, you, you know, it's like it's doing all these things. And, and you're like, well, well is, this, is this the world that I'm looking at? And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah show map. So you can show the map. You can actually see Africa is actually very, very specific. So if any of these African countries, and one of these is bloody Nigeria anyway. Hey, there we go. And this Nigeria is right in there. And if, if Nigeria had any information, it would be bigger. You know, it's a very, very standard sort of, sort of approach. And this is the data editor that they, they, they use. And this is what was built by Frank LaRocca, myself, and Ryad uh, within the five-week gap. <clears throat> and this is, um, you have 11,000 employees, which is actually correct. And this is how they sort of built it. So if I add a data set, which I'm not, I'm just going to cancel it before I actually do it. So I'm going to go blah, and they say next. Is there a data set um, over a period of time? Yes. And then it tells me, and I'll say, well, maybe not. And say no. And then I say by numbers or words, words. And then, oh crap, I think I created it. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Anyway, I did create that, didn't I? Anyway, cancel that, shall I? <clears throat> so you can also add, add countries, uh, delete countries. All those kinds of things. The idea of uh, over the course of time is like you can create, as I stated, you can create like um, you know from whenever to whenever, and you can actually scrub across it and actually see the the system change in front of you. And it doesn't have to be just in clusters. It can be in pie charts, viewing, all that kind of stuff. So that brings up a lot of ideas. Like, what can you do with the vi visualizing systems? Um, over the course of time. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Um, 
And you know, it, you know that, that, that's partly what we try to do within those particular five weeks. So they're, they're supposedly looking for some money, but um, we, we will see what actually happens. This is a test, and it's always good to have tests. I think sometimes tests are better than the final piece. In a way, there's no such thing as a final piece anymore. Um, in regards to the baffler, this is the baffler front end. So this is HTML. Oh my, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of HTML. I'm not a big fan of Flash, but I don't care. And and we just made it as simple as possible um, for for people to utilize. And then this is basically the MIG. Um, it's the mark. It will come up in a second. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a little change to something on the front end, just a, just a uh, duplication of information. I'll tell you how fast this thing is. So I'm going to log in. There you go. I've logged in. And whilst the ticker is going, I can actually go into the information. So let's go in and just like, uh, ooh. Oh, this is my, a I was going to run this presentation in the MIG. Because it actually has a slideshow view. <laughs> and I, I copped out. Sorry. Uh, is it going to come up? Yeah, there we are. <laughs> there, we, there we are. There's all your all the <laughs> files. <laughs> um, but I, I should actually delete this, shouldn't I? Uh, it shouldn't be on my client's that system. So I'm going to say goodbye, bye, and then drop it in and say yes. I'm I'm telling bye. Okay. So um, let's say I wanted to add some information to, let's say, a blog. So I'm going to say, my dad went to San Quentin and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Um, I'm going to duplicate this uh, blog. And so somebody online, I'm going to do this live. So somebody online is going to be like, there's an error. There's going to be, there's a duplicate of this particular thing. I can duplicate that item instantaneously. Go back to the front end. Let's just go back and do this. Uh, actually, let's, let's just do <laughs> this, the baffler.com, and then run the baffler. And the baffler should, I think, show me more of that information. There. See that? Twice. Right there and right there. Instantaneously. Duplicating content. It's kind of idiotic. but. Imagine that you needed to, you had a template that needed to be duplicated thousands of times or like twice. And then you needed to, ch you needed to change that information really quickly. I just did it instantaneously. That is, you know, that's what RIAs give you. And a lot of people might hate Flash because it's all about animation. No, no, Flex is really hardcore coding. And it's, it's, it's really great to utilize. I'm not you know, kidding around. JavaScript's really brilliant as well. But this has allowed us, as designers and engineers, to get into this particular realm. And we want to push it real hard. Um, and so you know, we've done so many different things with this. We've done the, 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 the view. We've done the uh, sh um, shot by fans. We've done um, UCLA. We've done this blog structure. We've done multiple things. And we, we keep on building with this. And um, you know, we want to go into installations, all types of stuff. So I, I just want to end there. And uh, I actually, wait one second. I should delete this, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> delete the item, please, yes. OK. Should go away. Thank you, and um, say thank you very much for your for your time and uh, and effort for coming here today in such a um, wonderful weather. <laughs> thank you so much. Question. So, oh, okay. uh, I was really encouraged. One second, sir. Oh. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say that I was really encouraged to see that there that it seems like the interface here 
is, is, is based on the same sort of platforms that Adobe yes, is using? Yes, it's similar, yeah, yeah. And, and do you really think that the, I mean, I, I predicted this, but, it, it, but that's only in, you know, in rants, um, that, the, that, uh, that the future of the web is, is a graphical interface that in the same way that at one time you had to write code to be able to write a postscript, that HTML will just be in the back end behind a graphical interface? Um, not necessarily. Um, I know a, there are, um, it's all about ease of use. And, um, you know, and it depends on how many features that you have. So one of the problems that um, you know, we, we have is that if you, you have a system that starts off really, really simply, like you click here, you click here, next, 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 next. What happens to more features? What happens when you add more features and how do they behave? Do they behave in the same manner? Not necessarily. If you ever use WordPress for the first time, like years ago, it doesn't look like WordPress before. And so they've, they've adapted to that process of like, we've got to make it as easy as possible for people to utilize. And they've tried really hard and it actually does work very, very well. We came into this particular um, policy uh, saying to ourselves, we got to do this from the beginning. We got to make sure that we have a system um, that is intuitive enough and flexible enough, scalable, to uh, take in a lot of content and a lot of features and behave the way that somebody wants to over the course of time of, of its use, of its existence. So for instance, uh, from the, le the left work tree to the, um, to the um, sorry, the right work tree to the left work tree, um, is very st very different. You start on you start on this side and you work over to this side and then you start back over. So it's a sweeping structure, um, similar to how the Adobe uh, Adobe actually utilizes um, its UI. But another thing that we wanted to introduce is contextual windows. Unlike um, uh, Adobe, um, whenever you're in the staging area and you're clicking on something, this particular window set changes to whatever you need. So it's contextually adjusting to what, what, your, what your needs are. Um, that's a very hard thing to deal with. You can, you can gain open another thing, but it depends upon what you have. So we're trying to sort of like, uh, you, know, um, you know, build out those particular bugs that we will have on those types of uh, issues. But we're getting there slowly, and we've been working on this for nearly two years now, um, very quietly. So we'll see what happens, if it will go anywhere or not. <laughs> Yeah. Right. How do you reconcile ideologically doing work for, you know, Prada or uh, J. Walter Thompson with the Baffler, for example? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Um, it's called money. <laughs> um, well, with with uh, with with Prada, I didn't have a choice. I, I worked a two by four at the time. But with JWT, it was all about money. You know, a lot of our clients uh, in 2009 just totally disappeared off the radar. They're slowly coming back now. It's not because they hated us, but you know, we we truly needed to cut our employees down, which is very unfortunate. But we had to do it, and I had to just go and say, "Screw it! I have to go to the ad agency to see if they've got anything," because nobody else had anything out there. And I just went there just to see if I could get some, um, some just like print stuff going on. But then, you know, Graham actually saw what I was doing, or what we were doing at the map office and what I had done in the past. And he, he had the knowledge to understand, you know what, this, this guy actually can do a lot more than I think he can. Let's get him on board to doing more and more slowly, build him up into other areas. So that was really the reason. I mean, um, ethically, um, I felt like uh, you know I needed to put um, um, food on the table, and uh, that, that's what really came first. Unfortunately, I mean, if I had another chance, I probably wouldn't have done that, and um, you know I would have steered away from the ad agency uh, model. Um, but uh, I'm happy that I, I didn't in this particular c case. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Thanks for sharing with us tonight. Um, You're welcome. I had two questions. Um, first, I was curious about your process oh. <laughs> and the 
the background of your team and how your team came together. Okay, process. Um, the process does depend upon the project, but we have this, um, I recall I was going to a meeting, we have this, this process of the five Ds. And then I said it in a meeting, and the guy's like, dodgeball? And five Ds of dodgeball? I'm like, no, no. So I changed it to like six in the end. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the idea of defining, uh, discovering, designing, developing, um, from development, you have debugging, and then you could also have documentation. So it's just like this whole <laughs> process is of, 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 of dealing with uh, particular uh, clients, and, and it works quite well with, uh, for us. Um, we try and take on jobs that are, I wouldn't say holistic, but um, um, have a... Um, you know, it's not just d developing a mark, it's a whole sort of package. I can't say it's a brand, it's a package of things that we are doing for this particular person. And then we try and, uh, and aid that client to extrapolate that. It's like, have you ever thought of doing this? And not, not because we, you, you, you know, we want to and it's fun, it's because they, they kind of need to. I think a lot of um, designers and um, you know, uh, creative directors and, and, and owners of design studios know about this. Like, you're sort of like, um, you know, thinking about this particular client that you can make it bigger and better if they actually just listen to listen to you. You've listened to them. You listen. They listen to you now, and you can extrapolate the. It's a little bit like marketing. You're trying to sell other areas to them to make them better, and so that's that's part of the process as well. The um, the other part of the the question was um, the backgrounds of of my. Um, uh, Studio, well, um, there's me. Um, there's Salvador Rara, who um, I actually came to me after a um, a lecture like this in University of Arts in Philadelphia in 2005. I gave with George, and he said, "Can I join you?" And I'm like, "I'm working out of my bedroom." <laughs> no, and. <laughs> And so he, he, he didn't hound me. He just said, come on, you know, like, you need an intern. Do you need an intern? Do you need an intern? Oh, yeah, okay, I need an intern. And so he wanted to learn more. He was doing a little bit of, uh, of coding at the time. He was a graphic designer, you know, a little bit of code. I like somebody who can code as well as design. And also, it doesn't have to code that well. You'll learn over the course of time. You know, you've got me, you've got others that will help you. You shouldn't be scared. He is not scared to try th new things. That is the type of person that we have. And so we have Brankita, who's like major, um, major queen of books and, and, and environments and stuff. And she's super great. She's, um, um, she's there. Um, there's um, Frank LaRocca. Um, who actually is also U Arts. I've actually taken a lot of students from the U University of Arts of Philadelphia. And, he, you know, he was actually, uh, if he hears this recording, he's going to be like, whoa. He was seen as very special to his professors. He's like, he's a special one. And it's like, he could code better than I could, like, out of the box. And he was 22. And he can design, not as bad as, better than me, but... <laughs> um, he, he's, he's quiet, he's resourceful, he's really clear, he's going to be really great. This guy's going to be really something. Um, and um, he was an intern for me as well. And, um, and then Raya Datui is, Raya's an interesting, uh, he's only uh, 24, 25, and he has a master's in engineering. In computer science and electrical engineering, and also deals with like music and DJing, and all kinds of things. And you know, he wants he does a lot of art installation structures and stuff. So it's a mixed bag. It's a small mixed bag. It kind of works. And um, you know, I know that Jared and Philip also at Potion have a, a mixed bag of, of guys as well. That's why they do so many inventive pieces. And I think that's really like if. You, you know, don't be scared of taking on something new. You know, it, it's it's gonna, it'll totally help you out. You know, I'm trying to learn German right now. My girlfriend's German, and it's it's fun. <laughs> but yeah, 
you shouldn't be scared of, of doing these types of things at all. I'm going to go back to 